Hello, and welcome to 5 Year Club video number 180, Bad Lighting Edition, because I need a little bit more light to, to do some reading. Let's think of a time when Harvard was only 49 years old. So there were people that were like, I remember that field before there was a Harvard. America wasn't a country yet, not for another 91 years. Relativity and quantum mechanics weren't a thing. Bacteria was discovered two years ago by a guy who ran a clothing store, which is called a draper store. And we are in the Edo period of Japan, which I think is like 1600 to 1838. Don't hold me on that. Something like that. Um, okay, let's go look it up, Lewis, because you can't say the wrong thing. 1868. 1600 to 1868. Okay, so I was off. My Japanese history, not the best, all right? And Japan was ruled by the Tokugawa Shogunate. And here is an actual picture of a PC game with the word Shogun on it. But I would like to think that this is approximately what feudal Japan was like back in the Edo period. Well, we are talking about the year 1685, and that is the year that the Japanese Family Storehouse was first published. And so this book finally arrived. Uh, it was shipped from uh, a bookstore in England, which has kind of a nice nice little bookmark here showing book shoppy like stuff in England. And what does this say? The Hay Cinema Bookshop. And where is the Hay Cinema Bookshop? It is Castle Street, Hay on Y, via Hereford. All right, well, there we go. And uh, Quinto and Francis Edwards, 72 Charing Cross Road, London. What's the difference between these two places? It's like two different stores or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, cool little bookmark here. And, um, yeah, so this book was published originally. Oh, it's a little mark on the cover. That's fine. Um, in 1685, of course, in the original Japanese. The Japanese Family Storehouse, or The Millionaire's Gospel Modernized, translated from the Nippon Itagura of Ihara Saikaku who lived from 1642 to 1693, which means he was 46 and only about eight years from his death when this book was written. It was translated by a guy named G.W. Sargent, who I need to look up more information on for sure. And I have a first edition published uh, from the Cambridge University Press in 1959. So we are fancy AF on the five-year club tonight. Ihara Saikaku, we've talked about him a little bit before, um, and uh, what did I want to highlight about him? I wanted to highlight this, so let's get that a little skinny again. There we go. Okay, so he was actually really, he, he was um, the son of like a wealthy merchant family. He then trained in haiku and poetry. Uh, he got married, uh, but his wife died, and he was really bummed when his wife died. And so he wrote this massive set of haikus for, like, day and night after his wife died, which got him interested in writing longer things. And kind of around the same time, he was like, screw all this, I'm going to become a monk. Um, and began seriously dedicating himself to kind of, like, longer forms of writing. Later in his life, he began writing racy accounts of the financial and amorous affairs of the merchant class and the demimonde. Would, I don't know what that is, and I'm not going to bother to click on it right now. We can look forward to nerding out on it later. These stories catered to the whims of the newly prominent merchant class whose tastes of entertainment leaned toward the arts and pleasure districts. Oh my. Um, specifically, when he studied poetry and haiku, he studied rinku, right, which is a specific form of haiku. Um, at rinku gatherings, participating poets take turns providing alternating verses of 17 and 14 morai 
Initially, Haikai Noringa distinguished itself through vulgarity and coarseness of wit. So he was a dirty old man who, who you know, liked poetry, before growing into a legitimate artistic tradition and eventually giving birth to the haiku form of Japanese poetry. So uh, basically kind of these dirty old man raps where people competed against each other to be nasty. That's what came before haikus, uh, apparently. And here's an example of that. He was given the following prompt. And this is, this is actually from Wikipedia. And it's not uh, that Saikaku was given this prompt. This is just an example from Wikipedia. He was given the following prompt. I'm not going to read the Japanese because I'm sure my Japanese is wretched. The robe of haze is wet at its hem. To which he responded, Princess Saho of Spring pissed while standing. <gasps> this poem clearly derives its humor from shock value. Never before had in Japanese culture... Never before in Japanese culture had anyone dared to talk of the goddess of spring in such a manner. Taking an ostensibly traditional and poetic prompt and injecting vulgar humor while maintaining the connection of the damp hymns and the spring mists was exactly the sort of thing that early haikai poets were known for. So, if there's anything the five-year club appreciates, it's injecting humor through shock value, making fun of something that no one's made fun of before. All right. And um, so that is the background behind this book. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to read a couple uh, pages from this book from the very first section. Um, straight out of 1685, guys. I have bookmarked the page because there is a lot of stuff in the beginning that's either background behind the author or background behind uh, Japanese culture and history uh, that... I have not had time to read yet today, and um, is not directly related to the things I want to communicate on this channel, which are primarily about personal finance, of course. All right, book one, Riding to Success on a Lucky Horse. Heaven says nothing, and the whole earth grows rich beneath its silent rule. Men, too, are touched by heaven's virtue, yet, in their greater part, they are creatures of deceit. They are born, it seems, with an emptiness of soul and must take their qualities wholly from things without. To be born thus empty into this modern age, this mixture of good and ill, and yet to steer through life on an honest course to the splendors of success, this is a feat reserved for paragons of our kind, a task beyond the nature of the normal man. But the first consideration for all throughout life is the earning of a living, and in this matter each one of us must bow before the shrine of the heavenly goddess of thrift. Not Shinto priests alone, but samurai, farmers, traders, artisans, and even Buddhist bonzes. What's a bonz? And we must husband gold and silver as the deity enjoins. Though mothers and fathers give us life, it is money alone which preserves it. But the life of man, at the longest estimate, is a day which knows no morrow. To some it seems a day cut short at eventide. Heaven and earth, the poet says, are but a wayside inn for time. A traveler on journey through the ages, and our fleeting lives are phantoms in time's dreams. People will tell us that when we die and vanish in a moment's wisp of smoke, all our gold is less than dross and buys us nothing in the world beyond. It is true enough, and yet, is not what we leave behind of service to our sons and our posterity and daughters? In fact, in, in, in American culture, when they do surveys, they find that women are more likely to receive an inheritance from uh, their parents than a man because uh, the parents believe the women will need it more. That's just a FYI, a survey done uh, by, the, by the author of The Millionaire Next Door. And while we live, to take a shorter view, how many of life's miserable, uh, how many of life's desirable things is it not within the power of gold to grant us? In all the world, there are five, perhaps. No more than that. Has any treasure which we see on prince of treasure ships more potency? Those invisible making hats and capes, for instance, worn by devils on an island no one has ever seen, they would leak as much as any in a cloudburst. I have no idea what that means. 
But, uh... Oh, it's the invisible hats would leak as much if it was raining. All right, very clever. So lay aside your dream of things beyond man's reach. Turn your minds to what lies close at hand and work with a will at the trades you have chosen. Since luck and profit come only to those who persevere, let none of you squander a moment in sloth between dawn and dusk. Above all, you must make humanity and justice the basis of your conduct and worship the gods and the Buddhas. This is the custom of Japan. It was the day of the horse, the first in the second moon. Through the spring haze shrouding the hills, men and women, rich and poor, were making their way on pilgrimage to the shrine of Kanon at Mizuma Temple in Izumi Province. None went in search of enlightenment. The roads they trod together the road they trod together was the road of greed, passing along endless mossy byways and over weary new swaled wastes of reed and mugwort and coming in time to this desolate village still bare of any form of blossom they made their vows to the temple's buddha but their prayers were mere requests for wealth varying only in the quantity each considered his due even for canon the thought of replying to them all, one by one, was too much. Instead, a general pronouncement was made in a miraculous voice issuing from behind the sacred alcove's curtain. Nowadays, in this veil of sorrow, it said, there is no such thing as easy money, and it is obvious enough, without your asking me, what each must do. You country people have your allotted means and skills. The men must dig the fields, the women must weave at the loom, and each must work at his task from dawn to dusk. To every one of you, I say the same. But, such as human stupidity, even this inspired advice failed to sink into the pilgrim's ears. Nothing on earth is more terrifying than the interest, which grows from debts. It was the custom at this temple for pilgrims to borrow small sums of lucky zenny. If they took one the following year, they returned two. If a hundred, they repaid two hundred. And since these coins were cannons, everyone and since these coins were cannons, everyone took care to use them for no idle purpose, and no return and to return them in due time to the temple. Amongst the pilgrims on this occasion, most of whom were borrowing the usual sums of three, five, or perhaps as much as ten zenny, was a certain powerfully built, plainly dressed young man of twenty three or four. The top knot at the back of his head was too far forward for the fashion. His kimono was long out was a long outdated cut, with sleeves too short and skirts too tight. The layers underneath, like the kimono itself, were of stout pongee dyed in patternless deep blue, and the collar band was reinforced with the same material. He wore a cloak of striped yuda pongee, lined with cotton. The dagger at his waist was short and muffled in a dust protector. The impression he gave was evidently of no importance to him, and now he had hitched the bottoms of his skirts to his loincloth and was to all appearances already on his way home carrying the rough-made basket of local potatoes strung from a wild camellia branch, which was the unusual which was the usual, usual souvenir for pilgrims to this temple. He turned aside, however, and approached the platform before the shrine. And I want to show you, uh, I want to show you just uh, a little bit of the art in this book. Try to close on that. I know it's really hard to see. It's it's hard for me to see. Yeah, old Japanese art. Maybe I can put like a picture. I can like take a picture of it and use that as a thumbnail. That's a pretty good idea. One thousand zinni, please, he said. The priest on duty gave him what he asked, a whole thousand zenny on a string, and even forgot to inquire his name and address. When he had gone, no one had any idea where to find him again. In all the years since the foundation of our temple, said the priests when they gathered together to discuss the matter, 
There has been no other case of our loaning a thousand zinni, and all of our borrowers, this, this man is the first to ask for so much. And of all our borrowers, this man is the first to ask for so much. It seems hardly likely that he will ever repay it, and henceforth we must make it a temple rule not to lend such large sums. The man's home was Edo in Musashi province, and there, by the wharves at the end of Koamicho, he ran a shipping agency. From now on, his household's fortunes steadily improved, and in his delight at this, he placed the temple money in a small ink tablet chest, and on the lid he wrote the words, The Good Ship Luck. Once, when certain fishermen were about to set out in their boats, he told them where this money came from and lent them a hundred zenny each. After that, the rumor spread all along the coast that good fortune befell any who borrowed the money, and the number of borrowers steadily increased. Returned with interest on each occasion and immediately reloaned, the sum grew larger every year. The merchant, meanwhile, carefully calculated the interest due to the temple at the rate of 100% per annum, and in the 13th year, by which time the original 1,000 zenny had swollen to a debt of 8,192,000, he sent the whole sum along the Tokaido on special hired pack horses. When it was unloaded in heaps at the temple, the priests at first could only clap their hands in dumb amazement. But later they called a conference, and all agreed that the matter should be made a source of edification for future generations. They hired hosts of carpenters from Kyoto, and in memoration of this truly wondrous profit from their zinni, they raised a fine pagoda. The merchant, to mark his success, set lamps to burn with never-dying flames within his money storehouse. His name was Amaya, and he was famed throughout Musashi province. Those who inherit nothing from their fathers and whose fortunes won and whose, and whose fortunes won by sheer ability exceed five hundred kanme of silver are known as men of substance. If their fortunes mount above a thousand kanme, we call them millionaires. By interest alone such money grows to tens on tens of thousands, and its voices swell in silvery songs to sing its lord's proprietary proprietary, bleh, to sing its lord's propriety, 10,000 years of luck. And that is where we end it. Um, and my understanding is that um, Amaya, A-M-I-Y-A, -A, is going to be uh, like a repeating character in this book. Perhaps I'm wrong. We have to, um, we have to get there. But we have now reached a second section, and that is just too much to read tonight uh, in, uh, in my Five Year Club video. So for sure, I will read the second section in a different video on a different night. Um, and you'll have to wait until then for another exciting episode of Five Year Club. This is video number 180. I hope you have a fabulous evening.